Welcome to Waltham Forum, where you can learn at your own pace in your own space, right in the comfort of your home or practice. You have a front row seat to view the most advanced techniques, diagnostics, treatments, and procedures. Knowledge that will enhance your ability to provide the very best care for your patients. Waltham Forum video series is produced by Waltham USA and the Waltham Center for Pet Nutrition. Waltham, the world's leading authority on pet care and nutrition, is the science behind the Mars pet care brands worldwide. Waltham Forum is created and directed by Veterinary Learning Systems, publisher of Compendium on Continuing Education for the Practicing Veterinarian. With each issue of Waltham Forum, you can earn continuing education credits from the University of Georgia. Plan a staff luncheon or a dinner around Waltham Forum segment. It's an easy way to study a new technique or train new staff members. A new key facts section in the accompanying booklet highlights important information about the equipment and pharmacologic agents used in each segment. You'll also find information about available back issues and in order forms so you can round out your collection. You'll have an easier time referring back to specific segments in this year's videos because we've given you a space on the sleeve to write your VCR's counter numbers at the beginning of each piece. These ideas and others have come from your suggestions, so keep letting us know what you want and what you like. In this issue of Waltham Forum Video, we feature staff members from the University of Wisconsin at Madison and the Animal Emergency Center in Milwaukee. Our experts demonstrate proper techniques for taking pulmonary radiographs and discuss the interlocking nail technique for repairing long bone fractures. You'll view the emergency response to a cat with pleural effusion and listen in on a case study of a dog with gastric dilatation. Feline chronic renal failure is the topic in the expert minute. Dr. Chess Adams of the University of Wisconsin discusses proper techniques for pulmonary radiology. Watch for these key facts. Positioning is critical. Center the beam on the caudal margin of the scapula. Place the forelimbs as far forward as possible. A very high KVP is preferable. Dorsal ventral views and ventral dorsal views are equal as long as proper positioning is used. Ideally, both right and left lateral views should be taken. Determine which pattern is predominant when presented with a mixed pattern. As a radiologist, when I'm teaching the students or talking to practitioners about getting uh, their radiographs, their radiographic studies, over and over again, I hear the problems with chest radiography, getting decent radiographs and being able to interpret those radiographs. So what I'd like to do is to share with you some of uh, the pointers that, that I think are important in, eva in taking the radiographs and then in interpreting them. And as I, as I see it, there's some critical aspects of getting the good radiographs that uh, I'd like to go over a little bit. The first one is obviously positioning. Now, positioning in any area of radiography is important. With chest, it's really, it's really critical. And I'd like to share a little bit of that with you. Uh, also, we're going to uh, look at, at uh, technique, why uh, technique is so critical with chest radiographs. And, and it, it really is because there's so much inherent contrast in the chest and because there's such a variety of opacities from clear lung to the heart, uh, that type of thing. I've got Winnie, the wonderful Springer Spaniel, here with me today. She's agreed to be a patient so that I can demonstrate positioning for the, radi for the chest radiograph. It's important to center the film, the, uh, your view on the middle of the chest, and sometimes that's, that's hard to sort out, particularly with short-chested dogs. So a, a location that you can usually find is the caudal margin of the scapula. If you can palpate the caudal margin of the scapula, it seems fairly far forward when you palpate it, but if you mark, if you mark that location and center your beam at that spot, both on the DV or VD and lateral projection, then you will truly have uh, the, the heart centered and the chest centered on the radiograph. A second thing that's important with the chest positioning is to have the forelimbs as far forward as possible. 
There's so much disease that occurs in the cranial thorax and cranial mediastinum, we've got to be able to see that. If the legs are pulled back, it's not going to work if they're back over the heart, over the chest. So we've got to get them as far forward as possible. If Winnie will lie still for a moment, I'll show you how to get a true lateral projection. To do that, we've got to get the sternum, the ventral part of the sternum, off the table. So many times they see chest radiographs with the ribs uh, rotated so that the spine is into the chest, and we can't, certainly can't evaluate the heart in that manner, and, and the uh, lungs are difficult to evaluate the, with the oblique too. So it's a simple matter of having a piece of foam, a foam wedge, and placing that under the ventral part of the chest, depending on how round-chested or deep-chested the dog is, just forcing that in, this is something your technician should get used to, used to doing so that they get a true lateral projection. For the VD projection or the DV projection, sometimes the dogs aren't as good as Winnie and they won't sit straight, they won't lie straight, and it's very frustrating to try to read a radiograph, a VD or a DV radiograph that's twisted. Remember these troughs that you used in school? They work very well, and we definitely rely on these whenever we have a difficult dog. I would advise that uh, your, your technicians or yourself will be uh, less frustrated with getting good chest radiographs if you have one of these handy. Once you have the patient positioned on the table, you've got to refer to your technique chart to get the proper exposure factors. When you, when you are measuring for the proper technique, measure at the same location as I described before for centering the beam, and that is at the caudal margin of the scapula for both the DV and the lateral projection. Here's a technique chart. KVP is really important with the chest technique. Here is a chart from a practice. You'll notice that the KVP, the top KVP used was 110. The bottom KV that they used in this practice was 70. I would prefer that you start with 80 and go as high as your machine will allow you up to, say, 125. Looking again at the technique chart, you'll notice that the time is very short here, and that's critical for chest radiographs because of the inherent motion. At the upper end of body part thickness, this is at 1 60th of a second. That's good. The shortest time on this chart is 1 1 20th of a second. That's great. To emphasize the importance of the high KV and the short exposure time, let's look at a couple of radiographs. Here are two ventrodorsal projections of a dog taken at the same photographic density, but different KVs. The one on the left is taken at 50 kV, the one on the right at 125 kV. Note that while they are both underexposed, the one on the left, you can't see any detail in the cranial or caudal mediastinum. You can see detail in the cranial and caudal mediastinum on the high kV technique. Also, there's motion on the film on the left so that lung detail is blurred, even the diaphragm is blurred, that detail is preserved on the film on the right, taken at high KV. Now let's compare this very high KV technique, 125, to a medium KV technique, this is 90, that has had the MAS adjusted so that it is maybe more aesthetically pleasing. If we look at the, and compare these critically, we can see that the, all the information that you need is actually on this underexposed very high KV technique. The point here is that the very high KV technique is more forgiving, and even though it may not be as aesthetically pleasing, it's diagnostic. Go with the high KV. How do you know when you've got the proper exposure after you've taken the radiograph? What I use is the spinous process beneath the scapula. If I can see it clearly, then I know there's enough penetration, the film has been exposed enough, even though it may look underexposed, in this case, because of all the disease in the chest. By way of critique, let's look at positioning. Is it a true lateral? No. The, the ribs are superimposed over the thoracic spine, the dog is rotated. 
Fortunately, we did have the chest properly positioned in the middle of the film with the caudal scapula, caudal margin of the scapula right over the center of the film, and we got the legs well forward so that we can see the entire thorax. On the dorsal ventral projection of this dog, we can use the same method to determine whether we've properly exposed the film. We can see the spinous processes of the thoracic spine over the heart. If you can visualize those, you have enough penetration. On this dog, it's a real challenge to get an appropriate uh, technique entirely across the thorax because of the disease that's evident. This is where the very high KV technique comes in handy. The higher the KV, the more chances that you can get to read the entire film on one projection. I've got two views of a dog chest here. One's a VD and one's a DV. There's the old question, which is better, VD or DV? I'll say this again as I say it over and over to the students. I don't care which one you take, the VD or the DV, as long as you get it straight. Now we recognize that there's a, there's a little bit of difference in the appearance of the VD versus the DV. We will typically see what we call the Mickey Mouse ear sign, which is the cura of the diaphragm, well outlined on the VD projection, which we don't see on the DV projection. Maybe we'll see the vessels to the caudal lung lobes a little bit better on the dorsal ventral view, but again, the view that is straightest will be the one that is most valuable. I have lateral radiographs on this dog, a left lateral and a right lateral. Which is better? I'd like to not discuss that issue. Let's use them both. And this is what we typically do. We take both a left and a right lateral view of the chest. This gives us twice the opportunities to get a full inspiration, to get the chest straight, and to see disease that may be hidden on the opposite lateral. And this is a case in point. Look at the lung fields over the heart silhouette on the left lateral, here. Now look at that same area on the right lateral projection. And you can see there's a difference in opacity between the left and the right. That's because there's disease in the left lung field over the, over the heart, and there is not disease in the right side. Notice the degree of lucency over the cardiac silhouette on the left lateral projection, and compare that to the same area on the right lateral projection. Note that it's more opaque in that area on the right lateral projection. That's because there's disease infiltrate in the lung field over the heart in the left, on the left side of the chest. It's hidden on the left lateral projection. Now that we've got the positioning down, we've got the technique right, and I'm sure the dark room situation is under control, we're ready to look at the films. When I'm looking at chest radiographs, there are three rules of thumb that I try to keep in mind. First, find the lesion on at least two views. That means we took three, and you found it on at least two of the three. To increase your confidence that, it, that what you're seeing, particularly in lung lesions, is real. So find it on two, two views. Secondly, look for the air bronchogram. That's a very significant finding in almost all cases when you can find it in the lungs. So understand the air bronchogram, look for it, find it, heed that sign. And thirdly, evaluate the lung parenchyma for the distribution of the pattern that you're seeing. And when I say distribution, I mean, is it bilateral, unilateral, is it dorsal, ventral? Keep these in mind. So these are the three rules of thumb that I follow as I approach the chest radiograph. Now for interpretation of the lungs, let's review the pattern recognition approach to diagnostic radiography of the chest. The first pattern that, I, that you should remember is the alveolar pattern. Second is the bronchial pattern. Third is the interstitial pattern. Fourth, the vascular pattern. And fifth, the mixed pattern. The alveolar sign is a very important sign, and it is identified by finding at least one of 
the three following radiographic findings. The first is the air bronchogram. If you see an air bronchogram, think of alveolar sign. Second, the silhouette sign. Silhouette sign is not as specific as the air bronchogram sign, but frequently is associated with alveolar disease. The third alveolar sign is the low bar pleural sign. This is evidenced by a normal inflated lung lobe being directly opposed to effect an affected lung lobe such that a specific line can be seen on the radiograph. You have normal against abnormal lung lobe, you get a line. Let's look at some radiographs that demonstrate the alveolar pattern. Here's a left lateral projection of a four-year-old Sharpe that was coughing and gagging. Note that we can't see any of the cranial lung field. If you look very closely, come in closely, you can see very faintly what I call a tree in winter, the air bronchogram sign. Now let's look at this same view of the same dog taken two weeks after successful antibiotic therapy. Two weeks later, that subtle air bronchogram sign that we saw before is no longer there, but we still don't have very much detail in the cranial thorax. Why is that? Okay, this is the dorsal ventral view of that Sharpe on first presentation, and here we can see a very obvious air bronchogram heading out into the right cranial lung lobe with opacification of that area of the chest. Now let's look at that two weeks later on the same view. Note now that air is filling that entire right cranial lobe that was previously opacified, consolidated, but how wide this cranial mediastinum is. This is a variation of the breed. The Sharpe has a very wide cranial mediastinum, making it difficult to see the cranial chest on a lateral projection. Now, if we compare back to the original film, we can see the difference between the air-filled, normal right cranial lobe and the opacified, consolidated cranial lobe in this dog that had aspiration pneumonia successfully treated. Points to remember, the air bronchogram sign, finding the lesion on more than one view, even though it was subtle on the lateral projection, and now the third point to remember is the silhouette sign, which is the absence of seeing the heart silhouette in this location because of the consolidated lung lobe directly in contact with it, the silhouette sign. This radiograph demonstrates the third sign that's seen associated with alveolar disease. And that sign is this low bar pleural line that we're seeing right here. And what this is, is a line created by the normal inflated lung lobe directly adjacent to a diseased lung lobe. We can't really see the, the borders of the lung, but we can see this distinct line between the two lobes. Now let's look at this on the other view. On the dorsal ventral projection, we see the silhouette sign that we talked about in the last case. In addition, we see this low bar pleural line between the right cranial lung lobe and the right middle lung lobe. Right middle lung lobe in this case is atelectatic and consolidated, giving us this sign of alveolar disease. This is a very common sign because the right middle lung lobe is prone to collapse and or consolidation. The second pulmonary pattern is the bronchial pattern. We see the bronchi only if they are thick-walled, if they're mineralized, or if they're thick-walled and mineralized. A third pattern that goes along with the bronchial, bronchial disease is if the bronchial walls are dilated, that is, the bronchi are dilated. So we look for thick walls, dilated bronchi, or mineralized walls. Let's look at a case of a dog that has a severe bronchial pattern. Here's a right lateral projection of a nine-year-old Siberian Husky that has a very poor gag reflex and a history of recurrent respiratory infections. Note the very prominent pattern. The pattern is characterized by numerous circles that are rather thick-walled in this case, 
and some linear, parallel linear patterns, which we call tram tracks or train track lines. This is the characteristic pattern of very abnormal bronchi, the bronchial pattern. On the dorsal ventral projection, you'll note that the dog is hyperinflating, a very barrel chested type of appearance. And if we look carefully, we can see these rings or donuts that are thick walled and some of these tram tracks that go out into the periphery. If we looked carefully, we'd see that the diameter of several of these are ex is excessive. Very widened bronchial walls, very thickened bronchial walls, very opaque bronchial walls. All three signs of the bronchial pattern. This dog has end stage bronchitis and bronchiectasis. The third pulmonary pattern, and probably the one that gives us the most trouble, is the interstitial pattern. Interstitial signs may be structured or unstructured. Structured are easy. Those are the spherical opacities that you see on a lung film. Unstructured is the one that is most frequently missed or confused.